When you're making an app, um, you can control a lot of the, the user flow and mm -hmm. the decisions that the user has to make. But in a game, especially games where it's a lot of high tension, high fast paced decision making, things like first person shooters, like any Call of Duty game, it's technically all just a set of decisions you have to make, you know, between point A and point B. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Bloomex Podcast. Uh, thank you again for MCRO for sponsoring this episode. You guys have been doing a great job on uh, continuing to support us in the community we're trying to, uh, trying to build. Uh, MCRO, if you guys are ever looking for any programming help, uh, building apps, software, definitely hit them up. They're super uh, responsive, LinkedIn and um, other channels. And also, again, thank you for Huddle for having us here at this beautiful space uh, and filming out of, uh, out of the conference room. Um, shout out to you guys. Alex, man, what's up? Uh, you're on, you're here for the 50th episode, so. 50 episodes. 50 episodes, Exciting. man. Um, we're halfway to our goal. So yeah, man. Halfway when, to 100. Yeah, on, halfway to 100. Like when we started this, we want to get to 100. Mm -hmm. So, man, thanks for being on the 50th episode. Glad to be here. Um, usually, every 25 episodes, we bring in someone from the team internally. Um, and you're someone that we really wanted to come on and kind of spotlight, right? You came on to the, the team like a few months now, two and a half months probably? Yeah, probably creeping up on three months, mm -hmm. I think, and yeah. like working together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really enjoyed talking about uh, games, game designs and the architecture behind that, but also like the classic games that we all grew up playing. Oh, yeah. Um, so like, we've known each other for like, what, two and a half, three years more? More than that, four years now. Yeah. Actually, longer than that, man. Probably longer than four years, at least from like when we first kind of met. You're one of the like original guys in the hub too, right? Like, yeah, yeah. When did you get involved with hub? Yeah. So uh, the first time I got involved with the hub at UTSC mm. um, basically was uh, for a job. Um, is that I was I'm, I'm a graduate of the co-op computer science program. Yeah. So going through there, we landed a contract with Parks Canada, yeah, and yeah. it was a sweet job. They wanted a, a mobile application, basically a virtual park guide for the Rouge National Urban Park, and mm -hmm. so landed in there, yeah. um, started working on that project, and at the time I was focusing on software engineering, that was kind of my forte, but then working in that landscape, I began to see all of these entrepreneurs come in and out, people working on their own ideas and their own you know, mechanisms, and I thought that that was really compelling in terms mm -hmm. of people just getting to be their own boss and action on the things that they love and the things that they're passionate about. And so working on that project, it almost turned into its own entrepreneurial remember, yeah. venture, yeah. you know, like we, we ended up like pitching them what their product should be. We ended up like doing prototypes and wireframes and mm -hmm. what we thought uh, a park guide would look like. They gave us almost no guidelines and like infinite freedom. Um, and we came out with a sweet project. It was an amazing team too. Like we couldn't yeah. have done it unless we had the, the four team members at the time. But yeah, I came out of it thinking like, you know, I want to come back here like on my own. So two years later, graduated and then uh, went back to the hub, joined and started my indie game studio, mm -hmm. Gem Token Games. You did it after you graduated, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you always had a passion for games. Absolutely. Yeah. Was this something life. that you wanted to do for a long time or, or was it more something that you want to do after this project? Yeah, yeah. After like the National Parks project. It, uh, it was probably something I had in the back of my mind my whole life, like just making software, but making games, mm. right? Because there's something really compelling to me just about like how people engage with these game worlds, you know? Because yeah. games to me, you know, it, it, a lot of people argue like, you know, our games art, our games, you know, a lot of things. But to me, it's just like games are things that change people's behavior, right? Mm. And so, that's kind of how technology was developing at the time, right? Is like people were building apps and building applications, software based on people's behavior. And so especially, yeah, you mentioned like when I came off of that, that project, right? Is we got to see like how it was changing the way people interacted mm. with their geospatial surroundings. Like they were in a national park. And so getting to see them, you know, like ping live locations and points of interest off of where they were and how that made them feel like interacting in the park. Yep. We actually built in, you know, speaking of games, gamification in that app, we, we, we managed to muscle in a little achievement system and uh, like a goal system for nice. tracking, you know, like how much you hike, how much you, you know, how many points of interest you visit. So that was almost the catalyst for like, hey, you know, I, cool. we can what, do this. Was that come from, influence come from you? 
Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I was I was pushing for that yeah. definitely for for the majority of that project. Cool. But uh, it came about from the need to uh, to motivate the people using the app, you know. And I thought, what a what better way to motivate people than through games? Yeah. I mean, the fascination with games coming came from playing games. Obviously, growing oh, up yeah. playing games. Oh yeah. What'd you play? Oh, growing up playing games, I, I'm still <laughs> playing yeah. games. Yeah. <laughs> Same here, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think I always find time. It's just a great way to like unwind, you know. But yeah. for me. Yeah, like I, I grew up, you know, I hate to say it, some people, you know, may, may, may rag on me for this, but I'm a classic console gamer. Yeah. Grew up with, I think the first thing, first console I got was the Sony PlayStation 1. Mm -hmm. Grew up playing Crash Bandicoot. Grew yeah. up playing, you know, <laughs> classic 3D platformers. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, PS2, PS3, currently PS4. Still into like, you know, a lot of action games, a lot of, you know, I play a lot of Monster Hunter. Played a lot of Dark Souls. Played a lot of you know really intense like action games, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And you yourself tell me about your gaming habits all the time. Oh, so. such an addict. I yeah. still am. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, we talk about like our, our Steam libraries all the time, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah. All all the games I wish we can play <laughs> yeah. but don't have the time to. Yeah, we yeah. Can't justify it anymore. Um, I mean, we literally joked about starting like a like a like a streaming. Like, uh, oh yeah, a streaming channel just so we can have <laughs> guilt-free gaming, right? Yeah, uh, that's the dream, right? Because you're just you're making money playing games. I mean, <laughs> people have figured it out. People have figured it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you were growing up in this generation, mm -hmm. would you be streaming? I think I would, honestly, because from my generation, like it, it's a little weird because I don't really feel like a millennial mm -hmm. or like a gen. I guess Gen Zer is the term, right? Yeah, like we're Gen Z, I think, right? You're born when? I'm. I literally don't know because when I look at it, like from you know different sources that say like, oh, you're a millennial, you're a Gen Z, you know, like they, 1995, the year I was born. That's like right on the precipice yeah. between these two. So I find I think the cutoff is 1994. Yeah, exactly. So I, it, yeah, I'm, I'm basically like a year into Gen Z, I guess. But I find that yeah, like I'm a little. I'm a little less active on, you know, the sharing, like just the media creation, media sharing, and I'm still more into, you know, just enjoying content, like playing games, you know, but I feel like if I grew up with the technology now to share your experience, you know, through YouTube or Twitch, yeah. I feel like I, I would totally be in the stream. Yeah, you know? I'm totally jealous of, yeah, yeah. of kids nowadays. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, was there ever a point where you're like, you're like, I want to, I want to develop games or I want to make games? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, like a specific point. Yeah. I feel like I thought about it like on and off throughout my life. Definitely in high school, I thought like, hey, I really want to make games. You know, like I, you know, and and, and it's it's a thing where I, I went back to it a lot. Like I I, I started um, developing, and I still develop in uh, the Unity engine today because it's a great mm -hmm. you know three D game development platform. Yeah, Unity is so, so powerful. Like I yeah. gotta know how powerful too. Talking to you. Oh yeah. I always had an idea of the framework, but um, how was that like? Yeah, like developing through Unity. For me, like as, as I was saying, like I kind of came back to it a lot. Like I, I tried developing with it in high school, learned a lot, and then kind of like went back and then tried again in university. And then after I graduated, then finally went back and really said, you know what, I'm gonna like learn this platform. I'm gonna figure out like how to fully create a game. And so that's that's what I ended up doing with, with my studio. But with Gem Token, uh, yeah. Yeah, with Gem Token Games, I managed to push out my first uh, mobile indie game. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like working with Unity has been great to see that platform evolve just in terms of what you can do as a single developer um, from graphics to assets to yeah. sound. You can really flesh out like a fully made game. Yeah, I mean, I've seen what you've done, like having like a 3D playable environment, building that out. Mm -hmm. I mean, Unity Game Engine allows for that. But yeah. what do you think is different, uh, different in um, building a, like a regular commercial app? versus mm. a game like what what's the level of thinking what's the level of technology acumen you need like oh wow that that is a really big question you know mm. because there's there's more similarities than you'd think but the differences are subtle but they do make a big difference yeah right like for one one thing that i can think of is like when you're making an app um, you can control a lot of the the user flow and mm -hmm. the decisions that the user has to make but in a game, especially games where it's a lot of high tension, high fast paced decision making, things like first person shooters, like any Call of Duty game, it's technically all just a set of decisions you have to make, you know, between point A and point B. The goal is to get to the end, but when you're in a firefight or in like, you know, a big battle scenario, you're basically, you have to account for the user going in from all these different angles to make one decision and then all the different outcomes from making that decision, you mm -hmm. know? So it, that's one thing you have to think about, like as a game developer, is just how many different ways 
can a user approach this given scenario and how many different outcomes can come out of that. Whereas when you make traditional apps, it's usually something like, oh, if they tap to go to this screen, you know, tap to go to that screen, tap to go blah, 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 you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, have you developed in any other framework other than Unity? Like any kind of, is there anything else for games? Um, oh, yeah. Unity is like the market leader right now. They're crushing oh, it. Oh, there's, there's definitely, I think, two market leaders right now. There's Unity for sure, and then there's Unreal Engine. Yeah. Um, those are at least the ones that I know of that are very big. They're very, they're very code-based. Unreal engines. is older than Unity, right? It's, Unity is newer? Unity did come out, yeah, newer, but Unreal has, has they've had multiple iterations. Yeah. They've, they're pretty much on par, I think, yeah. technically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, we talked a little bit about the games you used to play. Do you yeah. play anything now? Yeah, now, I th yeah, I think I mentioned uh, I play a lot of Monster Hunter on, on the <coughs> PS4. Again, I'm still a big console gamer. Like, yeah. like me and Ravi, we talk about like our Steam libraries, right? And yeah. now, like, we never get a chance to play. But I find now that like, you know, when I want to like relax and play a game and whatever, like, I have to be sitting on the couch, you know, yeah. controller in hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just how I feel. But Definitely. yeah, play a lot mm -hmm. of Monster Hunter. Um, Do you like those arcade style games? Like, um, Monster Hunter is like more of a Oh yeah, it's like an RPG, RPG like a bit right? action RPG, I guess. But uh, yeah, other thing, I'm trying to think of like other things I played recently. Played uh, Spider-Man on PlayStation Four. That was a great game. Yeah, you're telling me about Spider-Man, yeah, like, yeah. uh, how much, uh, how much thinking they, they did into creating oh, yeah, a hyper realistic uh, it, kind of imitation of New York City, it right? It is like a one-to-one -one recreation of New York in full 3D. And imagine like you know, it's just I think one of the most ultimate playgrounds of any game. Right, because it is New York, this sort of like fantasy version of New York almost, because it's straight from the comic book. So there's things in there like you wouldn't find there, you know, in real life New York. But imagine like, okay, you can now explore all of New York, but you can do it at like 80 miles an hour, swinging through between the buildings to every street, you know. So it really is just, it, it was a really fun playground. Like yeah. I think some of the best moments in a game like that is just like the movement, yeah. like just swinging around, you know. It, it, it really made for like a really uh, impactful experience. Yeah, but like looking at like the scale of games that are available now, right? It's yeah. Huge oh, open so world many. kind of uh, kind yeah. of concepts. Um, really shows like not just the growth of it, but the potential. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that you can appreciate about games and now later now video streaming is that those kind of those kind of high behavior kind of content really drove like technology. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like look if you look at game companies, how much they push the envelope mm -hmm. um, and what's possible, right? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of technology behind getting people to, uh, to change their behavior, you know, even just in the presence of that game, you know. There's a concept uh, a lot of game developers talk about called the magic circle, and it's kind of when you step inside of that circle, you're mm -hmm. now, you're across that line of, you know, the real world and the game world, so getting you to change your <coughs> behavior within that circle is one of the challenges and one of the things that, that games are great at doing, yeah. right? Is that like if you want to feel a certain emotion, you know, you can now do direct like one to one motion capture, mm. facial motion capture yeah. has gotten really good. Like uh, people's uh, expressions in games used to be like it was like a JPEG yeah. that would switch back and forth. Yeah. You played any of the old like Grand Theft Auto games, yeah. like the people that you go back, you think like, you know, GTA San Andreas. Oh, like oh, it was such a great game, yeah. you know, technical marvel. Yeah. If you go back and look at it now. It, it looks like just a mess yeah. you know, compared to what they have. What's like, possible visually. now, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's definitely the possibility, especially visually, like it, there's, there's a lot you can do there now. Yeah, um, I forgot the name of the company, but like uh, the guys that created Farmville, like Farmville. on top of Facebook, remember? Oh yeah. They became like it, their own like hyperinflated company. Like, yeah. Because they were the, one of the first to utilize play, uh, play Facebook en um, engine almost mm -hmm. to create their own game and utilize Facebook's um, the network, people. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, uh, one of the things they showed is about like if you make games just almost like clickbaity, mm -hmm. right? Like make them so engaging mm -hmm. that you know they can just suck up all your time. They really, they really kind of mastered that first, like the new age mobile gaming kind of thing, where it's like quick actions, where repeat actions, but like over long term. Like you know, like you play over the long term. Oh, what yeah. are those games called? Like I'm pretty sure the term for that, right? Like, uh, I I would like to just call them casual games. Casual if games. If I had to put a description to it, I guess some people call them idle games because yeah. you can just kind of play it idly, like you don't need to have a direct one-to-one -one, like input to get that output. Yeah. You know, especially games like uh, like Farmville, for example, right? <coughs> it's like you can 
build out there's mechanics in that game that let you just get income yeah whatever that economy is in that game i don't know if it's coins or dollars or yeah. farm bucks whatever yeah but yeah you, you there, there are things you can do to just kind of get that reward for just having that kind of idle feedback yeah you know? and I, I was never really much of a mobile gamer mm -hmm. until like I was, when I was working this office job the government contract and like I automated most of my most of my job most of my job was reporting I automated away a lot mm -hmm. of downtime so I wanted a game that I can just drop into in between tasks and I can keep playing mm -hmm. and and like uh, what is it? Not Clash of Clans. It was like a kind of game like that. Anyway, like just got a randomly, randomly looked into it, downloaded it, and I ended up playing for like two years. Oh wow! And like you know, <laughs> just because it's like it's just a daily thing. Yeah. And um, part of that, like part of that hook of mm. a game like that to be like, yeah, keep coming back. Yeah. Like the c consistently come back. You know, like downtime. It's just always available on your phone. Like, it's, 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 it's a mini time sink you can put into it just to engage oh, yourself, yeah. right? Like. Is it a new paradigm of gaming? Like, this is the marker, I think, of new age games, yeah. right? Is especially in, I think, how people realize these are, you know, things that people can engage <coughs> with, not just, you know, at home anymore, you know, on the couch mm. or on, you know, laying in bed, you know, playing a game, you know, whatever. It, it's more, you see a lot of people now playing games just to fill that downtime, fill the space between the things that they're going to do in their everyday life, right? On the subway, um, you know, riding the train, on a plane ride, you know, and this is the marker of these, these more new age games, right? Is people are thinking of ways to engage you in small bursts instead of long chunks of time. Those big investments, like when you mentioned playing for two, two and a half years, you said, right? Like it probably wasn't you were sitting down, you know, two, three hours a night to play this game, right? Like were you playing it, you know, at home or were you playing it just whenever you got the chance? Um, like what do you mean, like growing up or like now, like? No, the, the mobile game you mentioned. The, um, the yeah, anytime like I have them downtime. Like yeah. even like whenever like, like I procrastinate so much. Oh, I'm yeah. such a procrastinator, yeah. right? Like even like during the middle of the, I'm just doing a task and I'm like, mm -hmm. I just want a distraction open that up it's mindlessness right yeah it that, allows you to distract yourself from a task like mm -hmm. in between tasks i guess yeah that's that's exactly what i'm talking about it's that ability for those games to be instantly engaging and engaging in small bursts that allow you to play them to fill that that downtime right because as you say like if you're someone who's a procrastinator right and if you're going to procrastinate are you going to read a book take a nap or are you going to open up a game that's going to stimulate your mind, you know, yeah. and distract you from that thing you don't want to be doing, mm -hmm. you know? So that that's definitely like just a quality of, for mobile games especially, definitely. you can see a lot of them, they, they, they all kind of follow down that path, right? Of getting mm -hmm. you engaged quickly and short bursts over a long period of time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you know who Scott Galloway is? You heard the name? name? Scott Galloway, not, not doesn't ring so a bell. So he runs an analytics firm called uh, L2 Inc. He's also a professor of a a NYU. Mm. He got super famous for like making predictions about Amazon, Apple, uh, not Amazon, I think Google. Mm. Um, anyways, he talked about a bunch of things, but his, his main thing, his main argument is he, like, he's like making an argument to break up Amazon, Google, uh, mm. Facebook, and Apple. It's like they're too big. Mm. Uh, and part of the thing they're saying is that these four companies combined hire and employ 750,000, probably more now, 750,000 of the world's top minds. Mm. Top scientists, top engineers, top researchers, all work at, within these companies. Um, and you know, pre in previous age, like it was 100,000, I think it was 100 to 300,000 people who worked on the Manhattan Project. Yeah. This is 750,000 of the top scientists, engineers working on how to make applications more engaging. That's more weird. of a reward system, uh, you know, infect your, uh, infect your reward system, yeah. all right? Uh, take, make it like a, really a dopamine hit when certain mm. interactions happen. Yeah. Your phone is becoming a dopamine re like a reactor, like almost for, um, for your brain, right? Yeah, um, and not even just games, but just everything, mobile, yeah. mobile platforms mobile in, in general. general, right? If you're big into social media, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, Instagram is the hot one because yeah. it's just so, you can go right in, there's a photo right there and all you have to do is use your thumb and just scroll down and it's endless, endless, endless streams of dopamine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what else is Instagram other than a social gamification? Yeah. Right? It, yeah, it, gamifying photography, mm -hmm. you know? You get likes for your photos, you want the most likes, you want the most followers, it's 
it, it is a classic uh, gamified structure. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, these game mechanics are being utilized like almost almost universally throughout apps, even though, even though they mm -hmm. don't call it that. Yeah. Um, because they have to. They're fighting for attention. Yeah. Right. I mean, look how much like the screen time is almost valuable. Like mm -hmm. Facebook measures this. How much time during the day are you actually on Facebook or on that screen? Because what they're competing against is another app that's right next to it, right? Um, so making it as compelling as possible is there. And part of this thinking is behind games now too, to make them addictive as, as more than ever. And yeah. now that on, on, your, on, our, on our person, they can carry you around all the time. Like you play the new Call of Duty on, on mobile? Uh, oh, the mobile Call of Duty. I did actually play that in the beta it's just to try it out. Crazy. Yeah, very different from the console versions too. Like even just the vibe you get when you play it, you know, yeah. it's something that they want to like instantly reward the players. It's crazy like yeah. how fast you get you get placed into a global match. It's oh, a yeah. social game because you're playing with other people, so not not predictable robots. Oh yeah. And yeah. how HD it is. Yeah, and the big one I think, especially for like the newer generation right now, is Fortnite. Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? It's cross, cross platform, cross platform, all platforms. The rules of the game are simple, and you can jump right in on any platform wherever you are, as long as you have an internet connection, and and join that experience. Yeah, I remember a friend telling me this, and I didn't believe it. Like mm -hmm. he was a big Fortnite player. This is like two years ago, and like mm -hmm. it wasn't as big as this growing into a into a thing. Mm -hmm. And he was like, "Yeah, you can play some on your mobile." I'm like, "I don't believe you. What do you? Mm -hmm. you it's pop, you're probably playing playing against mobile players. Like, what do you mean?" You're sitting there playing against other people who's playing on Xbox or PlayStation. Yeah. One, yeah, of, yeah. one. How is that fair, and how is it syncing together? Who, how are they communicating, right? Mm -hmm. Like it didn't make sense. And he opened it up and showed it to me. And I'm like, holy, holy crap. Yeah. Right. This is like a different control interface applied on top of this game. Yeah. The the connectivity is there. It's just a different coat of paint. Yeah. For the, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier about uh, Eve, the online mm -hmm. online universe. Yeah. Almost, they created, one of the right? biggest in-game economies ever. Yeah. Ever. Game economies, like that's an interesting term, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that you can live within this game universe and actually yeah. extract real resource, like actually mm -hmm. get money and fund yourself from it. Yeah. How scary is that? It's, it, it is a, a scary idea that these economies can take over real life economies mm -hmm. in, in value, apparently. I forget, I, I don't know if this was like a clickbait article, if it's <coughs> even real, but I think there was a time when it was something like you could make more money earning gold in World of Warcraft yeah. than you could getting actual money in, I think it was Brazil <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> it's just crazy to think about that, right? Like you yeah. have people in, you know, and, and for a long time there's been this idea of like gold farming, right? Mm. Especially with MMORPGs. It's just these worlds that developers kind of throw you into and the economy is dictated by the players themselves, which yeah. is almost a mirror of real world economies. It's yeah. just all virtual now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like MMOs especially like this are almost catalysts for how things like Bitcoin came about, you know, virtual currencies. It's just taking that currency aspect of these game worlds and just focusing solely on the currency, you know? Is there any games right now utilizing crypto, like as an actual in-game eco economics? I think there are. I think they're very experimental. I can't name any off the top of my head, yeah. to be honest, but yeah. no big ones that I can think of. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, have, you, um, have you heard of like CryptoKitties? Oh, that see that 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 rings a bell. Yeah, I have heard of that. Um, that's you, that's you know, kind of what, you know I mean. what it is. Yeah, it's like you raise cats or breed cats, essentially, like so virtually. What it is is a system that every fifteen minutes it mm -hmm. creates a crypto kitty. So it's a token mm -hmm. that's actually that, that's physically seen as a cat, mm -hmm. but the cat is broken down into multiple components. Like it has a DNA. Right, so it can, it's randomly generated, but it might have blue eyes. Oh, but the okay. blue eyes are coded to its DNA, it's code, code DNA, it's, code, it's tokenized DNA. Mm. Um, and then you can, I think, buy it for a certain amount. It starts at 50 bucks. And mm. you gotta use, I think, crypto to buy it. Um, but again, it's, it's a crypto token. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, when you own it, you own that particular one. It, it's under your, almost like your wallet. Yeah. And you can trade it, you can sell it to other people. But the cool thing is, you know, you can also crossbreed with other crypto kitties to create another one. Yeah, that's, that's mixing the, the genetic material, yeah. creating a completely cold new asset. Mm -hmm. And some of these assets, like the, the, the community has grown so wild that have inflated the cost of these. I mean, some of these have sold for $100,000 dollars mm -hmm. or higher. Um, just because you know people want all these rare attributes that are the system has created now you're yeah. combined into an even rare form now you're pretty much building an asset like a collectible it's a collectible yeah. 
that's a collectible. See, that, that's, that was one of the main motivations behind uh, the company I started, uh, mm. Jump Token Games, right? Because I wanted to look at um, the future of collectibles and gaming. But you bring up a really good point, yeah. right? Is that this idea of the collectible itself is kind of its own game mechanic. Mm -hmm. Is if you take something like what they did for cryptocurrency and they saw that, well, you know, maybe general audiences won't be as likely to get into cryptocurrency, but they would be more likely to breed virtual cats, you know? And that's, that's what they saw, right? Yeah, and so I mean, then you just say, oh, well, some cats are rarer than others. Some cats, you know, the DNA you mentioned is more valuable than others. And so that game, you know, players don't even need to, essentially there, that is just a mask in front of that economy layer and just turns it into something fun. Something like that people will, you know, gives them that dopamine hit. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, like, okay, I thought we, we talked a lot about this. Like what goes into like thinking about a game mm. economy? Yeah, like in, in terms of how you build one? Yeah. Structure? Yeah, I mean, is there any layers of thought into this? Because like I, I started looking into this, right? I got, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I got really into games and I'm thinking about how to apply games into real life scenarios because mm -hmm. games are so fun and engaging. Yeah. Why can't my, why can't we use that to program my task? Like I talked before, like I'm <laughs> super, pro I'm a procrastinator. Mm -hmm. So if we can create like Asana but gamified, mm -hmm. all right, like wouldn't that engage you to be more productive? I think so. I think there's a way you can do it well and yeah. I think there's a way you can do it poorly. Um, and, and the difference really comes down to how you value that economy, mm. or more specifically, how you value the currency in your economy. Because say, you know, say you made a point system where you tracked every action was worth a certain amount of points, and some actions, the harder to perform actions, were worth more points. You want to create an environment. You want to create that economy, not based on telling players, oh, get your number, get your points to the highest number possible, yeah. but the way that you, and, and you mentioned like Asana, as you know, the purpose of Asana is to complete tasks, right? So you want people to feel like by completing tasks, this point is a reflection of the amount of effort that you put in. Yeah. Because when you contribute to a game world, it's essentially trying to convince people that the work that they put in to that environment is worth it. Make sense? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, an interesting way to think about it when you, when you frame it like that, mm -hmm. you know, how is my time put into this artificial virtual thing exactly. worth it? This is why people play games, right? Yeah. You know, we, we talk about, and we've talked a little bit about games so far and gamification, but they are, there are, they are two sides of the same coin, right? Mm. Is that games are just these artificial entities that are trying to convince people that the actions they put into this entity are worth it in mm -hmm. the end. You know, and worth it typically in a very intrinsic sense, personal to each player, you know, like you are improving in this game, yeah. per se. And then the same thing for, for uh, when we talk about gamification, you know, the idea that you can apply game design principles to other platforms and to other systems in life. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just telling people and, and providing sort of a, a layer on top of that system to say the actions you put in here were worth it because of this, 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 and this. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, when I was studying neuroscience, like we mm -hmm. talked a lot about like how dopamine and the reward system gets, you know, interactive when you take various different types of drugs, both legal and illegal, mm -hmm. how it works and things like that. But there's no like organized, like uh, academic push to think, to start looking at this from how software and our relationship with especially mobile mm -hmm. and screens is reflecting a reward system. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm super, I'm like, talking with you, I mean, we, I think we talk about this a lot more than mm -hmm. like I've read about it anywhere else. And even looking into it, I've, I've been hard pressed to find material on this. Mm -hmm. But you're immersed in this world, like where, where do you draw your information from? Um, in terms of like the technical knowledge? Yeah, like technical knowledge, like I, oh, actual, like, okay. like, you know, the, the hard science behind these things, because there is hard science yeah, behind yeah. this. I, I think for me, mostly it's, it's YouTube. It's mm -hmm. watching people who are experts or who claim to be experts talk about these subjects. Um, I've seen a lot of lectures posted on game theory, mm -hmm. game design theory. Uh, I wish I could say I've read more books on this for sure. I'd love to find like some of the better sources on, you know, especially academic sources on, yeah. on game theory. I, I wrote a couple papers in university about um, some game related topics. 
Um, I took a course called Online Games in Virtual Worlds mm -hmm. with uh, uh, Dr. Greg Grafham, who we, we both yeah, know yeah, from yeah, ATSC, yeah. director of The Hub. Uh, That's how you met Gray initially, yeah, right? Yeah. That, that I, yeah, I took that course. I, I met him first for the Parks Canada project, but then through, through there. But in that course, I, I wrote a paper about, um, uh, what was it? It was on World of Warcraft and uh, counterculture amongst... Uh, counterculture. Yeah, counterculture amongst people playing um, on the active retail servers and people playing on illicit private servers nice. at the time. Because yeah. there was a big controversy of... Uh, at the time, I, I'm forgetting the name of the server, but it was uh, the company decided to to crack down on this illicit server that was very very popular at the time, and it was a version of the game that currently wasn't available for paying players to actually experience. So people got kind of up in arms about that. So uh, yeah, like researching that, you know, academically was interesting. I read a lot of papers. Then. That's hundred percent something I would see gra Gray writing a class in. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. That, I, I think it was one of the most fun classes I took yeah. uh, in all of university. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Gem Token, right? Um, sure. About NSC enabled, tokenized, yeah. real world kind of games. Yeah, so I'll give I, you. I like the concept. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll give you a bit of a history on, on what I was thinking when I made Gem Token, right? Mm. Is uh, I, I had just graduated and um, I always thought, I mentioned collectibles, right? I'd always thought that the idea of collecting was very um, integral to a lot of the games that I enjoyed, you know? And collecting really boiled down to growth. It's all about growing mm -hmm. something, whether it's, you know, if you play Pokemon, it's about catching them all, right? If you play World of Warcraft, it's about growing your character, collecting the most armor and items, things like that. So when I started Gem Token, I wanted to approach collectibles in both a digital and physical sense and combine those two ideas together. And I decided to look at the technology of NFC to, to implement that. And so I pitched the idea of a toy, a line of toys, which were collectible figures that you could seamlessly tap to your mobile device, scan them in, and they would enter that game world and you could interact with them, play a game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a concept that few game manufacturers toyed with, but you did mm -hmm. it with NFC, which is yeah. no one's really mess, messed around with when it came to, like game, to running a yeah. game buying idea, right? And this was about a year ago mm -hmm. when I started to build out the prototype for this. And even then, NFC, I think, was still in a, in, in a very developing phase. Like, it was still kind of being onboarded for devices. I know that at the time, like iPhones, it, it wasn't fully integrated yet, at least natively. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of like doing that for the first time, I think I was, I was looking at it from a very early stage. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, hilarious now that we're working on, on NFC technology together. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, coming from that kind of background, you're really kind of we're versed in that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. So we're really blessed to have you on the team in this kind of regard <laughs> because um, you fit right into exactly what we needed before we realized it. We didn't, like we've kind of, not pivoted, but kind of moved into this realm of NFC technology mm -hmm. and realizing this is becoming quite a, a like a, not a battleground, but like a opportunity. Yeah. And, I, and we're piggybacking on the fact that these big platforms are realizing that too. Mm. Uh, we're talking about how, you know, Samsung is making a big push for NFC, Google, Apple, even Microsoft to some extent, mm -hmm. um, just because of the ease of transferring information to each other. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about NFC and like why the it's powerful as technology? Yeah, I, I think that the power of NFC comes from the desire that people want objects mm -hmm. to have context, if that makes any sense, right? Um, and I think that the best NFC products really showcase that, in that it's something that you can interact with digitally, with mm -hmm. something you carry around with you every day, your phone, and uh, you can get more information on that object, per se. Yeah, so it's like, it's a very low, low price model of IoT and things. Yeah, yeah, it's very cheap to implement. NFC stickers are very small, very tactile, like they can fit into different things. They're pretty durable and, uh, they're, and, and they last almost forever because they're not powered on until you broadcast that signal to pick it up, which is great because then you don't have to worry about having, you know, like a power source for it or yeah. like a big bulky chip, you know, to support that. Do you know how the hardware works at all? Yeah, essentially it's like a radio antenna, um, which is curled around just a very small um, inactive data storage. It's only like a few, I'm not sure the exact amount of bytes, but it's a very small, small amount of information. 
And so those coils are not powered um, until you broadcast an NFC signal from your device, whether it's you know, a phone or a tablet. And so then that signal broadcasting out powers, goes through that coil, powers the chip, and then sends that signal out. Yeah, so you're pretty much sending power. It's like a magnetic field, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. It's a magnetic yeah. field that projected from your phone that the, because the way that the coil uh, interacts with the magnetic field, mm -hmm. power gets produced, mm -hmm. and that power triggers like a, um, a circuit to broadcast? Yeah, essentially. It, it's a circuit that is set to do one thing, to mm. broadcast that message, and so turning it on does that automatically. And that message can be switched around change around to whatever you want. Yeah, so, and that's the beauty of NFC, right, is it's programmable. Mm -hmm. So by, by uh, connecting to one of these, you can store your own message in there, whether it's like you know, a link to something online, whether it's uh, its own piece of data. Mm -hmm. um, the misconception, though, I feel like with NFC is that right now, uh, they're, they're, the purpose of them isn't to store large quantities of things. It isn't to store that data you know, in, in, in a, a tactile form. It's more to just act as a key to tell your device where to go to find more information, mm. if that makes sense. How would it, what are the limitations? Like what can you, how much information can be stored in NFC? I, mean, I should know this. Yeah, that, me too, I know, I'm blanking on it, but I, I feel like it's only a few bytes of data. Only a few bytes of data, so that's yeah. why we use a lot for like links, mm -hmm. like linking to something. Yeah, because you can fit a URL in there pretty easily. Yeah, uh, back to Jim Tilkin. Sure. Right. Um, what were the challenges in like in this game? Was it developing the game, using oh, yeah. NFC uh, as a technology, building out the actual models? Like, oh, for sure, it it, it was very all of the above. Um, and I'll tell you the journey that I went on through that was was a bit of a rocky one yeah. because I started developing it. I'm I'm a solo developer. You know, I thought like, oh, this is gonna be great. Yeah. I've got this great prototype. I pitched it. It's awesome. Um, and then working on it, realizing that. You know, I have to prototype. Not only do I have to prototype these models, I have to think about how they're going to be made for consumers and where am I going to source this, where am I going to make this, and also I have to be working on the tech side of this too. And as, as hard as I was looking for other developers and other people to work on this, I was also trying to make it at the same time. And so it leads to a problem that a lot of developers face, which, which is burnout, working in isolation, you know. So coming to the end of that, I thought that this is a great idea, but it's gonna take more minds than me to actually fully implement, um, especially when it came to the, the physical hardware side, because the software side, the game was coming along well. That wasn't a, a, a huge issue, because I, I thought of like a structure of play that would be fun and mm -hmm. engaging, especially for, I was trying to target younger audiences, uh, I think because kids would very easily resonate with that like collectible idea, you know? Um, so I thought of a very engaging system of play and I was building the game out and then what actually happened is I was building out a portion of the game which I was building. I think I'd called it, I think I'd called it Manabytes at the time. That was my title for that whole NFC toy game. But then what happened is I was building out a mechanic and I thought, hey, th this is kind of fun like as its own game. So I spun that out as uh, an Android game called Loot Goblin. And it was essentially just a, a treasure collecting, um, really easy to play, intuitive, one touch control um, uh, mobile game. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I started building out you know reward systems for that, um, looking at you know monetization. That's how I started my social media, you know Twitter on that around that same time. And I was starting to really feel like a, like a game developer again, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned a valuable lesson: is that like you can plan all of these systems out, but to avoid, you know, that burnout, like you have to find um, the team members and the people who are going to, you know, engage with you on those topics yeah. and, and push you forward. And, and it was around that time too that I ran into you guys. Mm -hmm. And you guys were talking about um, the need for, for game design and motivating people through games. And so that really, that really clicked with me. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, working in sales, uh, I've been working in sales like twelve years and. Mm. It's pretty much a gamified workspace. Mm -hmm. um, the more commission is involved, the more bonuses is involved, mm -hmm. the more gamified a sales team becomes. Mm -hmm. um, funny enough, like I mean, one of the things we're we're looking into is like you know how do we automate away certain parts of that? Mm -hmm. You know how do we help to help codify sales more to give analytics to salespeople? And if you look at sales, I mean, how many people? How many places does? Uh, you have like a leaderboard 
or you set up like a, a reward system, like you know somebody wins a, a free trip to here. I've had a CEO once go into a sales team pissed off because of the numbers, put up the keys to his Maserati, <laughs> and be like, whoever gets the most sales this month will get my Maserati for three months yeah. to drive. It's yours. Yeah. I mean, so that's how much you want it. Like, that's yeah, how much yeah. a, the, the, how much a uh, revenue meant for the company. Mm. And motivating the team was that important that he's willing to give his own Maserati to do. Yeah, right. That, so that's one of the great qualities of like a job like that, right? Mm. Especially when you look at it from how people are motivated, is that it's one of those careers where intrinsically built into that career is is the desire to win mm. more so than others, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the dangerous things about about sales too is that mm -hmm. the desire to win yeah. can push you into it, like it's a tough job. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. It can push you into those limits where if you don't win, you start feeling like you know, you're know you losing and you're losing. Yeah, that's the other side of the coin. If you're not winning, you feel like you're losing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's why tracking your progress is so important. Mm -hmm. right? um, yeah, and, and sales is like very important too because like it, it, especially if you look at the SaaS sales method, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. Salesforce kind of brought up this dividing up the, 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 the the um, what is sales cycle into multiple components mm -hmm. and having different people taking care of it. So the, the classic example being a business development rep leading to an account executive, right? Mm -hmm. So business development rep screens potential leads and turn them into prospects, get them interested, do the first initial part of the sales cycle, and then hand off to an account executive who's more in charge of closing the deal. Mm -hmm. And this two-part methodology kind of clarifies the roles, right? Almost like, you know, in, 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 like, in like sports, assists. Right, someone's always someone's mm -hmm. assisting the main the main score, and uh, your job is siloed into this role. So you're cycling it through it, you're churning it out, turning out results, and you're passing it along, and that is a team me mechanic behind sales. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when I was seeing and I, when I was doing it, I'm like, yeah, this is, this is a lot to do with some of the games I've played, <laughs> or like some sports we've played. Right, mm -hmm. it, it it the same kind of mechanics is there, and when you look at it and you look at how like sales sales teams especially like. More, a lot of organizations have this kind of, I mean, not so much anymore, but pool they hire from. Like you hear of, of lawyers mm -hmm. who hire only from Harvard. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. In sales, like people will hire only from like for certain fraternities. Mm -hmm. You came out as a fraternity, mm -hmm. or yeah. like you came out of uh, you you played a certain kind of sports. Uh, yeah. I know one of my friends who went into even like um, become a fireman, right? One of the main things is like, did you play hockey? Oh, wow. And part of that is more, so everyone looks at it, it's like, oh, you're being uh, exclusive, you're excluding f certain people, you're creating a monoculture. But part of that is also is uh, any place that requires a lot of trust to be there, mm -hmm. a aka a sales environment where like a lot of money is being floating around, you're supposed to be doing your own part, or like firemen where it's like it's, it, you're, you're in a very trust-based environment, mm -hmm. police officers, same thing. Um, you kind of want someone who came from that kind of background as you. Mm -hmm. The more similarities you share, the more you can trust somebody. Yeah, th this is actually a really interesting thread of conversation, right? Because what we're talking about are, you know, if you were to tell someone this of, of an industry like this or a job like this where it's that exclusive, people automatically would tell you, right? Like, oh, yeah, that's horrible. It's horrible that they do that, you know? Oh, but this, this is something that I think can be solved, right? Yeah. And it can be solved through the exact systems we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. with, with reward-based systems that motivate people to do better, but not only that, show that the action you put in was worth it, going back to that idea, right? If you could show that the actions that anyone did were reflected in a really clear-cut manner, it would be so easy for people in jobs like this to hire, to hire outside people, because then they can give, they can say, oh, I can trust this person, mm -hmm. because they have done all of these things that show that they're the right fit for this job. And until then, until you have platforms like that, you're gonna continue to see this in, in a lot of these industries. This exclusivity becomes almost a, a, a crutch for hiring the people who really will be the best at this kind of job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Let's take me back to like, uh, like the, what you're talking about, games and applying to the real world industries. Mm. Uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of push for that. A lot of companies have tried gamification engines, tried to put ga gamifying jobs. It's, it's been happening for 20 years. Oh, yeah. A lot of hit and misses. Yeah, uh, some way, you, shape or form, a lot of people are trying to, to, 
to motivate people. For yeah, games. do you know any successes in this, like game mechanics being used in real world situations? Sure, in the workplace or just real world? Anything. Real world, I think a very common one you hear a lot, especially for, for technology, the place they did it right was, uh, was Nike, I think mm. it was. Um, the tracking, Run? Yeah, the Run, Run app. Yeah. That was, that was a big success. Um, that was like the first real big thing is like, whoa, what mm -hmm. happened here, right? Because that's mm -hmm. not something you think of as a game. Yeah. You're not thinking of it as a game company. Yeah, Nike, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. I, I would almost say on the same thread, a lot, a lot of companies that got it right um, were, were credit cards, um, rewards cards, you know? Any, any company that decided to start up, you know, a, a reward-based system, even say like Starbucks, you know, come in this amount of times and get a free uh, a cup of coffee. You know, I think that they were on the right track and, and that's almost the catalyst for people realizing that these rewards, these systems that, that people interact with and engage with can bring them back to be our customers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's worrisome to, not worrisome, like, mm -hmm. like it's disheartening to think that the biggest, I, I guess, um, problem to get, get us going is mm -hmm. getting the right formula, the right fit. Yeah. Like, one of these ideas I looked into is uh, it's, a, it's a crypto concept um, called Colony IO. Mm, okay, I love these guys, right? So Colony, what they wanted to do was break down companies into tokenized objects. Okay. So you are become a tokenized version of yourself. You now create social contracts to mm. form to be part of this company. So this company exists. This is what it is, and then you you can be it can be a company, it can be a community, wh whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can set your roles or responsibilities within that. You can also set like how much ownership you have in that. Mm -hmm. um, you can also have you being the independent, your own company. And then now that's it. other people have their own company and now you're forming a third party thing together, like a joint venture. Oh, okay. And you can all do yeah. this all virtually, mm -hmm. right? And you can see it in real time. So you, you, you can see all the different players and how, how you're transacting. And then you can set, if you want, your own in company or in community economy mm. that can then transact with the, glo the global um, colony economy, which then can transact with other in, in <laughs> like in company economies that other yeah. people form. Wow, yeah. Right? Yeah. So they have created this virtualized workplace or like framework for companies to exist, mm. for communities to exist, to um, create or distribute. Um, I guess rights and protections, like mm. rights and uh, I guess uh, ownership and equity into things. Uh, I'm really interested. They just launched their beta right now. We just got. Uh, I've been following it for like two years. Oh wow! So, oh, so they've been building this up for a long like two time. Two years. You've got invited into the beta. I'm gonna check mm. them out. I haven't had a chance to, yeah, but love awesome. love the idea, mm -hmm. right? Of being so transparent about who owns what part of your company and how that works, mm -hmm. and being able to do it so inferiorly, right? Like. Like imagine independent players coming in and be like, okay, cool, you're a graphic designer, I'm a video producer, um, you're a salesperson, let's form this company together, you will get deals, whatever deal comes through, we charge X amount, it gets split three ways when this, 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 that's done. Mm -hmm. And deal comes in, right, goes through a three part, three say check mark, check mark, check mark, check mark, the company holds the money in trust, mm -hmm. right, that they, they, they charged, or it can be a social contract between two companies, so 50% gets paid, held in trust, last bit gets paid, and they distribute it to the whole team. Wow. Like you could program the process and, and like uh, the funding of your company. Mm, that's and interesting to think about, eh? Right? Yeah, right? Like, because you know, it, it acknowledges the fact that people can't action on everything alone, right? And it takes a lot of time to get those transactions to happen, especially between people of different departments, different jobs. People want to start a company. Yeah. You know, they feel like, oh, that's a lot of weight on our shoulders, right? Something like that totally, you know, takes that weight off. Yeah, I mean, we're, mm. we're talking about this before about how this kind of concept could work on a Unity engine. Because, mm -hmm. like, we're visual creatures. I'm super visual, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one limitation of Colony is I'm not sure what the UI, UI looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been waiting for the beta for that. Yeah. But, like, imagine a system where you can visually see how a company is divided mm -hmm. and see, like, money coming in, <laughs> yeah. money coming to all its parties, and then the company blo blooming as that the profits stay within the company. Yeah, and you yeah. set milestones within, the, within yourself. When you have X amount of dollars here, you're gonna purchase this equipment or expend to this type. You know, like having a visual path mm -hmm. for this third party thing that you're creating, your company, your community, your project, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of like gives a lot of transparency mm -hmm. into what you're building. 
Yeah, data visualization, something like that. And, and just data in general is so important to something mm -hmm. like that, right? Because once you tie data and people together, then you know who's doing what things, where those are going through. And then if you can be transparent about that at the same time in a very meaningful way, then that's a powerful tool, you know? Because we, we've talked about this a lot, like visualizing data in 3D, like in real time, right? You know, what are the benefits of that? Well, the, and the first thing that I think of is you can then get into displaying data geospatially, yeah. you know? Where is stuff growing or shrinking? Like, what is the process getting to that place? You know, if you could show data across a 3D map in, in, in a very visually striking way, I think that's a, a powerful tool for, for lots of different platforms, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean any... Um cool ideas or concepts right now you feel interested like are you, are you are you following anything oh for Any projects for other projects yeah i see so much all the time it's almost like a blur like i i i, I don't even know any game or any any technology or something that sticks out to you that you like whoa there was i don't know if this is a, this is a weird example yeah. but there was a game that impressed me lately it was for a game jam um on on itch.io which is by the way is a great site yeah you told me about this itch.io itch.io itch itch yeah like like itchy okay yeah itch.io great platform if you want to just browse um like brand new really experimental indie game content just okay, cool. on the web it's okay. an amazing site that's a good uh, good name for that <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's good because it, uh, it lets people put their work out there, even if it's just a, con a concept, yeah. like something that they want to experiment with, that they're thinking like, hey, this might be a good game idea, put it out there um, for free or paid. Yeah. You know, They can decide their own strategy of what they want to do with that. Oh, cool. But then people can play it and give them feedback. And so there, there was one, so the, the reason I'm mentioning this, there was one game that impressed me on there where it was. Can we bring this up actually? So you can, oh, itch.io, yeah. yeah. sure. Itch.io, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, go ahead. But yeah, there was one game on there which, I think the, the title of it was something like Flap or something to do with, it, it was, you, you were like a little chicken who was- Talking about Flappy Bird? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, Flap, I you're say, a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember that right yeah. away. But no, it, it was this game where someone thought of the concept of using the, the, the game window, the yeah. actual window on the PC as the entire, like the whole way that you interact with it. So as you play the game, you can't actually use the keyboard or mouse or anything. You just drag the window around and then the character who is this bird like bounces around the screen and you can only see parts of the level in that small window and you have to drag it across, like physically on your desktop. Like you have to drag the pop-up around. And I thought that was really cool. Because That's in okay. I'm, I'm always interested in ways that people build movement in their games. Yeah. I think that really inspires me. And a lot of the games that I've loved growing up, they, they really have nailed how, how the, players, the player character moves in a game. I don't know why that's so engaging to me, but something like that really stuck out because it's like, come on, like mm. dragging around the pop-up window. Yeah. So yeah, the, this is itch.io. It's, it, it's, it's great for just exploring indie content. Um, there's even developers here who put stuff on that they're a little more well-known still indie developers but yeah you can find a whole mix of stuff here cool so this is, consumes a lot of your time yeah I, I spend at least like you know a couple hours on the weekends just browsing through finding like cool stuff cool little projects to play also twitter too is a great place yeah. to uh, to find new game content a lot of people don't know this but yeah. there's a lot of hashtags you can follow just to see like what indie developers are working on that that's almost half the job like i found when i was when I was making um, that mobile game, mm -hmm. the, the spin-off of that NFC project, uh, Loot Goblin, I found that the, the more you engage with that community online and, and almost half your job as a game developer is just talking about your game, you know? Like seeing how people feel about it, gauging their reactions, and then trying to make it, you know, as appealing to that audience as you can. Yeah, I mean, Twitter's yeah. a, uh, one thing that I really could not get, ever get into. I mean, mm -hmm. on all socials, except Twitter. Like, I've tried a few times. Yeah. It, it, um, it's a very different kind of social media. It is. I'd almost say it's more of a broadcasting engine than anything. I mean, I think it's become more than that. Like, I think that's, a, that's the main utility of it. Mm -hmm. But it's almost become like a um, collective consciousness yeah. of, yeah, like, yeah. Of, the, of humanity. Because the amount of people that's on it. Yeah. The you, amount you, of, you see the term Twitter, do your thing a lot, yeah. you know? Yeah, when yeah. Twitter is just this mass of, of personalities almost. Yeah, and it's like a huge collection of thoughts. from like yeah. And like... And like you, by the filtering, you're, uh, you're, the filter you apply about who you follow creates mm -hmm. a filter bubble of information mm -hmm. that 
becomes your realm within the sphere, right? Yeah. I mean, every platform kind of does that where it kind of segregates you, but I don't think anything does it as much as Twitter does. Yeah, and especially you start to notice, like it's very at the forefront now, like ads, advertising, yeah. and you, you start to notice, oh, all these ads are tailored to me, all the, you know. Yeah. But I feel like Twitter, and maybe YouTube a little bit, yeah. tailors the actual content of that platform to you very, yeah. very well. Cool, man. So, man, we're wrapping up our 50th episode. Yeah. Um, I know you watched a lot of like our episodes um, oh, yeah. and, and content, right? Yeah, there's uh, been some great ones. Yeah, sure. anything, you, anything you appreciate, anything you like? Oh, um, I mean, the first one with Axel was a great kickoff. Yeah. Um, I think one of my favorites of all time was the Michael Cronin episode. Yeah. Great to hear like his journey. Um, and, and one of the recent ones that really stuck out to me was the, the cons and kernels. Yeah, Emily. Um, yeah, Emily. Yeah, yeah, that was an amazing story. Like just <laughs> listening to that story, like I was on the edge of my seat, like this, like this, this can't be real. Yeah. Like, there's no way. Like, she was a good storyteller. Yeah, yeah. Like she, she tells it incredibly well. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a great episode. Um, yeah, there's countless others where there's, there's stuff that, that blows me away. I mean, are you into podcasts? Do you listen to a lot of podcasts? Not as much as you'd think. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm, I'm more just like a random content kind of guy. Like I, I'll just listen to just videos. It could be a podcast, could not be, but I don't actually have like regular ones that mm. I listen to other than Blue Max. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. And also a lot of, th- a lot of uh, a thing that surprises people about me too is I'm not really a big music guy either. Yeah. yeah, I don't really have any favorite music at all that I listen to. Um, I like to have chatter on in the background, mm. but yeah, I, I, I don't know, kind of scattered in that in that regard. Yeah, I've really become to, uh, really started appreciating the chatter background noise, mm-hmm. like university studying. Yeah, and that slowly evolved to like, because like music is it vibes, you get to vibe too mm-hmm. much. If you're doing like something like physical, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. But when you're doing something mental, the chatter is great. But yeah. I mean, I think podcasts and audiobooks mm-hmm. are a great way to utilize downtime. Yeah, or like lost time. Oh yeah, 100%. You know, like when you're driving, mm-hmm. like how much hours you spend in traffic and driving, you, mm-hmm. you look at it, um, or, or um, you know, commuting in general. Yeah. In general, especially in Toronto, where it's <laughs> where roads are horrible, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's recapturing lost time, mm-hmm. um, where you can use that to learn new things, learn how different perspectives, um, and seeing from that kind of framework, I've gotten pretty addicted to it because it's a way cool way to consume information. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, audiobooks I haven't been, been able to get into just because I like uh, I like uh, physically reading something, but and seeing yeah. things in front of me. But man, podcasts are it's yeah. a great way of getting new ideas. This is this is a great way to think about you know kind of the marker of of how we're progressing into content. Um, what's the word? Absorption. Consumption. Yeah, I consumption know, right? of content is is across you know podcasts, media, games too. Is uh, you see the more new age stuff being more susceptible to idle consumption. Like it's just filling that space, that downtime when you're going, you know, doing something where you can't, you know, you just have that like static, you know, that you need to fill, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, you know, like, this is, again, this brings it back to games for me, but uh, one thing, uh, remember, you know, probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular mobile game uh, to ever come out was Pokemon Go. Right? Yeah. Remember the launch of that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I so, was so addicted. So it, behind the scenes of that, right, yeah. is that the, the, one of the overarching goals of that game was to try and gamify, to fill the void in going outside, just wandering. It was so you effective. Know? And it, was, it got people outside, going to places that they would never go, walking around because it gave them goals, gave them things to do. And so the reason I bring that up is because you know what the next project is that they're making? Mm. And I'm not kidding you. Mm-hmm. They want to solve the problem of getting a better night's sleep. And I'm not kidding you. The next thing that is coming out of this branch of mobile games is Pokemon Sleep. Catch and collect Pokemon while you sleep. Wait, what do you, how do the mechanics work with that? Uh, they haven't shared it yet, but it's in development. And they've just said that we've solved the problem of people getting outside. Now we want to tackle getting a good night's rest. And so that kind of message but with Pokemon, not yep. a different game. I know that company, um, they've made other games. Yeah, yeah. But this is with Pokemon. Yes, yeah. this is a sp- this is a Pokemon game project. It's literally called Pokemon Sleep. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even kidding. And it, it, they, they have a, a short trailer out and it is someone like putting opening the game and putting it on their pillow and then just going to bed, you know? That's yeah. hilarious. That's the gameplay. And they haven't revealed like everything about it, but I'm excited to see just if this brings about a new wave of idle gaming while you sleep. 
I mean, that's what I liked about Pokemon Go mm-hmm. and even this new concept is that, mm-hmm. I mean, it, was, it came back to something we're talking about, improving people. Yeah. Right? Improving people through technology. Yeah, How exactly. can technology be utilized via the time sink or like a deterrent or like mm-hmm. just a dopamine rewards engine, mm-hmm. but to actually drive some kind of positive behavior? Yeah, growth. Growth. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, let's, like, uh, we're going to wrap up soon, but like, sure. one of the things we're going to talk about too is like also this gaming in this age of loneliness. Mm-hmm. Right, like yep. we're ha- having almost a pandemic. I think we're gonna see it next few years becoming more of a pandemic. But how many people are not connecting anymore? Who are mm-hmm. almost enslaved by technology? Um, you know, you know, like using technology to connect with other people, but not really getting the rewards of other people. Like yeah, if you look yeah. at a lot of kids nowadays, they don't make eye contact anymore. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. not used to it. Yeah, it, it's something you, you see is a lot more common. Or at yeah. least I see it. Yeah, um, and like, what's this leading up to? Like, um, I think these kind of mechanics, like mm-hmm. what, what like, uh, the company makes the, the Pokemon Go, what they're looking into, yeah, yeah. is is so useful mm-hmm. because if they can showcase that, yeah, like positive attributes or certain attributes that can be beneficial to people can be can be motivated this way as well. Mm-hmm. Why not? And one of the things I was thinking, thinking about is like, I think about this a lot because how do you how do you gamify fitness? Mm-hmm. Like Nike Run, brilliant. Yeah. Palatron now built a billion dollar empire oh, yeah. off gamifying what was an existing business for 20 years. Yeah. Like stationary bikes. Yeah, your fit and fitness is a huge one too. You get, and, and it's almost parallel to the advancement of wearable tech and, and, and of hardware too. Because the better equipment we have and the better devices we have to monitor mm-hmm. different things in our body and everything like that, it, it becomes a matter of like, okay, now what software layer do we need to put on this to engage people? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and that's like what Nike run, like uh, came up with, right? Is that they, they, they made a, a kick-ass piece of software to, uh, to engage people. Yeah, I, I mean, improving people through the technology that we use, right? How do mm. we cohesively combine people together with technology so that it's working hand in hand? Yeah. Instead of being one, one leading the other, okay? Technology mm-hmm. leading the other as it's being utilized right now. Yeah, it's a balance. Yeah. 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 Like I was thinking about like, you know, like I was telling all Opley, the Opley team about this. Mm-hmm. How can you just utilize like, like certain physical equipment in like a gym to codify what you're doing and turn it into a game of like of development? Because mm-hmm. people love competition. And I think one of the biggest problems right now that's happening is that people are not getting the, getting the spaces to compete or mm-hmm. get challenged enough. Yeah. Like if you look at schools now with participation trophies and... Um, or the, the kind of take it easy kind of culture mm-hmm. we have it's like oh you're anxious oh you're depressed you know take it easy take some time but like yep. what people need especially i think people growing up is challenge yeah doing things because they're hard yep. so, there's a great quote about the moon landing about why we went to the moon jfk speaking about this he's excelling the american people and why mm-hmm. and it's literally what he said was we want to do this because it's hard mm, that right? is, yeah dale can you pull the clip of that jfk speech on the moon? actually we cannot play that I'm pretty sure it's copyrighted. <laughs> YouTube say, will pull are you that. Get in trouble for that. Pull, YouTube will pull that. But yeah. like, um, it's such a great quote. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you pull up that? Uh, maybe a writing of it, like how, what the quote is. JFK on yep. um, doing things that are hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think this is really important because Joe Rogan started talking about this, and I, I really bring, bring it back up in the culture with his platform mm-hmm. about doing things because they're hard, and taking upon the challenge upon yourself. That's yeah. where you experience growth. And yep. as a human, like you experience that, like yep. you, you value that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like especially kids nowadays and adolescents, the people who like, really exit that kind of monoculture mm-hmm. of like, uh, of being lazy or not, get, not being motivated or feeling lethargic, like mm-hmm. they exit when they find a purpose. They, they get motivated themselves, they motivate themselves. Yeah, Th- this is where challenge comes in, right? Is challenge facilitates growth, not because it's easy to get there, right? Is yeah. It's hard to get there. So when you finally do get there, you can look back and see all the things you've done, yeah. you know, behind you and the things that you've accomplished to get there, you know? Absolutely. Because if it was easy, you know, I'm pretty sure that that's what JFK is trying to say here, right? Like yeah. if it was easy to get to the moon, they, they could do it, but it's hard and that's why they want to do it. That's the why yeah. behind that action. Yeah. So we'll, we'll end the episode with this quote. So. JFK, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept and one we are unwilling to postpone. 
I mean, it goes on part of his speech, but mm -hmm. those words are moving. Powerful. And I think in this new age, challenge is a great thing. And um, hopefully we can, with what we're building, we can bring some challenges to the world to help improve more yeah. people. Yeah, let's catch a challenge in a bottle, use it to grow people, motivate people, change behavior. Yeah, cool. exciting. Let's do it. All let's right. Let's do it. Awesome. 50th episode. Yeah. Alex. It's been great, man. Yeah, man. Perfect. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.